recently I've been adding hot bars to one of the games I've been working on, and I thought about it and realized that that's something that goes in a lot of games. Just about every game can use some sort of a hot bar system where you can just dynamically add hot bars and buttons and make them clickable or hotkeyable. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to set that up, how I use on validate to kind of shortcut the process and make it a little easier, and just how to build your own hot bars. So let's get going. Here I've got a sample project set up with a single hot bar panel. And if we look here, you'll see that I have a horizontal layout group and a simple hot bar script on it. Underneath that, I've got a single hot bar button. My hot bar button has a button script. It's got a hot bar button script that I've created. And then underneath it, I just replaced the text with the text mesh pro text. Now, if I duplicate my button though, you'll see that I suddenly get a button two and a button three and a button four and a button five and six and so on. And it'll just keep going on and incrementing. And if I hit play and I just start clicking these buttons, watch the console. So I'll hit two, for instance, I see button two is clicked or I can click on five and button five was clicked, hit four, or six, and if I go to like seven or eight, you'll see that nothing happens. And all of this was done dynamically, and it's very, very simple to do. So let's see how it all works. The first thing I want to do is take a look at this hot bar. So I have this first hot bar button, and remember I said we have just a normal button. All I did was create a button, but I did add this hot bar button script. We're going to open this up. Now I'm in Rider. If you're not used to this editor, it's awesome. I love it. I was going to do a video on it and I'll probably do it soon, but it may look a little bit different. Don't worry. It's still very similar to the codes all the same. So here we've got a public class for our hotbar button. It's a mono behavior because it's a component that's going on to our game object. And we start off with a public event action that takes an integer called on button clicked. This is an event that's going to fire off whenever our button is clicked, either by keyboard or mouse. And then that's actually what's being registered for and logging out the uh, the log message that we saw. In fact, if we go to this hot bar right here, you'll see that in our hot bar script, we actually just go through an awake. We find all of the children that are hot bar buttons. So we're getting all of those buttons that are under the panel. And we're going through and registering for the on button clicked with the plus equals. That adds a listener to the event. And it, that listener is this method right here that takes a button number integer because we had our action type set to int. So this is getting called and we're getting the button whatever clicked every time. So that's where that log message is coming from. The next thing we have here is a private key code, a private text mesh pro text, and a private integer for key number. We're not setting any of these values. Remember, they were already being done dynamically, automatically, and that's happening right here in this on validate. Now, you notice here in Writer, it says that this is an event function. This is essentially a Unity function that's built in, and it gets called whenever you save or compile. So this is happening every time we go in there and make a change. Also, when the object is created on validate, it's called. That's why when I duplicate one of those objects, it automatically gets updated. So how does it get updated? Let's take a look. Line 16, we set the key number to our transform sibling index plus one. So the sibling index is just the index of it compared to all of these other objects. The first thing under this panel is going to be index zero. The next one is index one, index two, three, four, and five, and so on. Now, if I rearrange these, watch. You see that, um, well, they didn't rename, but if I save... And as soon as it finishes saving, it's going to rerun those on validates. And then these buttons, there we go. They've nicely resaved and set up their order. So rearranging them again, won't trigger that on validate, but a save or a build or basically any change to your code, which causes it to build and redo it, will update all that stuff. So we get our key number and we increment it by one because I don't want a key zero to be the first one. I want key one to be the first one. Then we take our key code and we set it to key code dot alpha zero plus the key number. Now, if I delete alpha zero and just hit like control space here, you see that we have alpha and let's start typing alpha. You see that we have alpha zero through alpha nine. So this is only going to work up to key number nine. If I want to get zero on there, I need to change this around just a little bit so that it's smart enough to catch a zero because otherwise it would go up to equals. So it would skip past zero and minus and go right to equals for the next one. But this works great for keys 1 through 9 or even 0 through 9 if I wanted to start off at 0. Then we, well, we do something else that's cool in on validate, which is that we get the text object if it's null. Let's go look at that. So if we look at our hotbar button, and, um, oh, 
Well, actually, it's always going to be null. Why is it always null? Because we're not serializing it. So if I go up here, I can actually, in Rider, just add the to serialize field attribute. And then I'd move this up because I don't want to keep my serialized fields mixed with the private ones. Now, this won't get called every single time. It'll only get called the first time or when it saves, which I think is a little bit better. So now, let's see. Let's try that. We go back in here, we should have our text right there set. And if I clear it out, set this back to none, see that it instantly went right back to the correct value because on validate was getting called and updating it. So here we're just checking to see if the text is not set. And if it's not set, we set it to the child. Pretty simple, right? Then we set the text value calling text.setText. This is the text mesh pro method for setting text. And we pass in the key number to string. So this is giving us that one through whatever. And then we set the game object name to the hotbar button. So if we go back in here, you see, that's why we have hotbar button, whatever. And if I duplicate, we get hotbar button seven and the text got set directly to seven. So awake, what does that do? Well, in awake, we need to register for our buttons on click method. So if we go back to unity again and look at the button right here, we have this on click event and this needs to be set up. So we set this up at runtime in the awake method instead of through the editor. I generally prefer to do that because then when I want to look through the code and figure out what's going on, I can see the actual um, the references there and the, the event being registered and what code it's calling into. Instead of having to go into Unity, dig down, find this specific object, go find the button script, and then look and see if it's set up right. When it's all done in code, it's a little bit easier for me. Now, of course, if you're working with designers or something who can't do this all in code and they need to make these changes in, in the editor, then sure, hook up the, uh, the events in the editor. But if you're just doing it like programmer way, I'd just do it all in code usually. So next we have our update method, and this is where our hotkey buttons actually work. So when I hit the button, this is what's happening. Our update method is calling. We check to see if that key was pressed. Get key down checks to see if it was pressed during this frame. And if it was, we call handle click, which just calls on button clicked, question mark dot invoke, and passes in the key number. If you're not used to the question mark dot invoke, that's the same as saying if on button clicked is not equal to null, on button clicked, key number. What's happening here is that we're just checking to see if it's null and calling invoke, which is the same as we could do like this. We do invoke here and it does the same thing. So it's just a nice shortcut way to only call this if something's actually registered for the event. Otherwise, we don't call it. And if you did it without the question mark like this, we'd still call it, but you see that there's a possible system.null reference exception. So writer even wants to recommend that we just do that. And then if I hit it again, it's going to say, hey, use that null propagation to simplify it. So that's how the whole system works. And that's everything we need to it. So what else could you do with this? Well, if you look at the hotbar method right now, right now we register for the click and we don't really do anything, right? We log out a message. We could do some work in here. We could set some data here. Another option, for instance, um, one of the things I did recently with this was to make it so that you could assign something to these hotbars. We could simply go into our update method and perhaps say like if input dot get key I don't want to use get key down because I'd want to check to see if one of these keys was held. Say so like if key, uh, let's see, let's go for alt. Maybe like the left alt. So if the left alt is held, maybe I don't want to handle the click and I want to do something else. So I put like an else statement here. So if the left alt is clicked, maybe I'm uh, assign the selected thing to this button. So it's like shortcutting this thing onto the button. It could be like select, you know, maybe there's a field on here for the selected object or the selected, the one I was using was NPCs. So the selected NPC ID could be assigned to this button. And then when you click on it, it could just call and reset that selected NPC to your selected one. So do something like, in fact, let's just mock that up here. If I did it, I'd do like a private int selected NPC ID. And I'd probably put my underscore there. And then here we'd go like a selected NPC ID equals, and let's say I have just a static or a singleton version of a NPC selector. So like NPC selector dot selected NPC ID. So I'd just be setting it right there. And this doesn't exist, but whatever. Let's make a public static class. Uh, NPC selector. And then here it has like a public static 
int selected npc id. Now, of course, we'd have a, a more complicated system for this. But here, what we could do is set that selected npc id for this hotbar button. And then maybe in our handle click, or instead of a handle click, we could do the opposite of this. In fact, this is kind of what I do in my other code. We do just about the opposite of that and set that selected npc back. So then this could be like an npc selection button. And perhaps in the update or in this handle click, because I'd probably realistically, I'd move that there. And here I'd call the handle click. So then here, maybe we could even update the um, the text there or show an icon that shows the NPC that's selected. Or maybe it's an ability or whatever the thing is for your game. Remember, these hot bars could be for anything. Could be a tool, could be your game, could be, I don't know, some random application. Whatever you want to use it for. So the main things, again, I wanted to focus on are that we want to make the simple and use on validate to auto generate these things. There's nothing worse than going back in here and resetting up these buttons over and over and over. If I'll make a change to one and I don't have these as prefabs, um, I don't want to go back and recreate that change on all of them and reset up the ID. If I had to go in and select like hotbar button number one and key code one and hotbar button two, key code two, I'd be a lot less likely to make minor changes and tweaks to this because it'd just be t kind of a pain in the ass and really tedious to go through that. So on validate really simplifies this kind of stuff. And then just remembering to keep the code relatively simple. Remember that this button can just check for the input and assign something. It can do something really simple and still work all as a hot bar and just kind of tie in with everything. Anyway, I hope this is kind of a helpful video. This is something like I said that I was working on personally and I think it really applies to real projects. So if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, make sure that you drop a comment below and like it and share just so that I know the videos that are popular are the ones that I do more of. Also, a special thanks to everybody on Patreon. Really appreciate it, guys. It's awesome. I plan on doing more stuff there soon and just posting more project source code and stuff there. So if you're interested in joining there, please go check it out. We also have meetups every couple weeks where we just get online and everybody hops in. We talk through our problems and help each other out. So if you're interested in joining that, check it out too. Anyway, thanks again for watching and bye.